let me talk about design-based estimation specifically uh, for domains. So in that case, what we have is, again, a population that has, let's say, capital aim elements, and we are interested on, normally we split the population in domains, we make a partition, but we don't have to. So I'm just going to focus on one subgroup of interest UI. So there is a group UI of units that is contained in the population, which is the one that I'm interested in obtaining estimates for. That's my domain of interest. And I'm going to assume that that domain of interest has size ni. What I want to do now is not to estimate the theta at the value of the whole population, but rather to estimate theta i, the theta for that particular domain, or a set of them, because as I was saying, sometimes you just split the population in groups and then you're interested on the whole set of theta i's. For example, if you split the population in municipalities, then you're interested on your parameter for each one of them, so you have a set of thetas, uh, actually. And I want to estimate that parameter after having, after having observed a sample of n elements that uh, is that is contained in U. So this is the key thing about domain estimation in general, is that I'm going to have, hopefully, some sample in that domain. So there may be SI, uh, which is the intersection between my whole sample and that domain UI. SI is the observed sample in the domain of interest. And that sample, I'm going to assume that has size NI. The issue with um, estimation of domains in general is that in NI is random, even if N is not. So I can say that I'm going to select a sample of 10,000 observations, 10,000 units, but how many of those units actually belong to a particular domain is a random quantity. And depending on the sample design that I'm using, that can be zero, or it can be very small, or it can be relatively large. It depends on the sample design, it depends on the domain, it depends on many things, but in general, it's just it's a random quantity. So it's it's going to be something that is more difficult and all that is going to be translating in terms of variance. Those estimators for domains are going to have larger variances because those sample sizes are random, because I may end up with zero sample size or we may end up with a very large sample size or I may end up with a very small sample size in that particular domain. Now you see here why stratification is useful. If I use a, sam a stratified sampling design, then I can fix the sample size that I want to observe in that particular domain. But if I didn't stratify by domains, then this quantity is random. Examples of uh, this situation. So now my parameter, for example, theta i is going to be the total of the variable y in domain i, which is just defined as the sum over all the elements that belong to that domain i of the variable of interest y k. OK, that's pretty straightforward. Now, I can also write that in a different way, which is extremely useful for this framework of inference, okay? So this was income, and I'm summing all the observations of income in municipality I. I could also write that as a sum over the entire population of a new variable that I'm denoting YIK. And YIK is what is called a domain-specific variable. So I'm going to create delta ik, which is a binary variable, an indicator, a dummy indicator, a domain indicator that takes the value 1 if observation k belongs to domain i, 0 otherwise. Okay? This variable tells me which observations belong to domain i. And then I'm going to build yik as yk times that indicator variable. So that means that yik takes the value yk for everybody in that domain i and zero the ways. So now I don't need to sum over the small domain. I can sum over the whole population. So I can write that parameter in these two different ways. I can either sum income over the small domain in that municipality, or I can sum a variable that takes the value yk if you're in that municipality and zero otherwise, but over the entire population. Okay? Those are the two different ways of writing this. <clears throat> Analogously, I could be interested in estimating the mean. So that could be also my parameter. 
And then in that case, the mean for domain I would be given by the ratio between the total of YK in domain I and the population size of domain Y. Again, I can write that as YK summing over the domain or as YIK summing over the whole population. This is uh, also called pi i if you have y being binary and then what you're trying to estimate is just a proportion. OK, nothing very fancy about these things uh, here. Now, those are the definitions of my parameters. How do the estimators that I introduced before look in this case? So, for example, for the total, for the estimation of the total in the domain i that I presented a moment ago, I could have a Horvitz-Thompson estimator but now for that particular domain. And how is that Horvitz-Thompson estimator looking like? I can do two things again. I can sum over the sample of that domain of the observed income <clears throat> and divide by the corresponding inclusion probability. Or I could sum over the whole sample of that variable that is either yk or zero and the corresponding uh, expansion factor. So that is going to be this is why this expression is very helpful, because if I know how to calculate Horvitz-Thompson estimators for the total of the population, then obtaining estimates for domains just represents you calculating Horvitz-Thompson estimators for the total of the population, but of that new variable. In terms of processing, this is extremely helpful. You just need a function that allows you to calculate estimates at the national level, and by defining convenient why you can use that same function to calculate the estimates for any domain of interest. That is why that expression, this expression involving the domain specific variables is, is very helpful. <coughs> I could also use, I introduced it before, the Hayek-Brewer estimator instead of the Horvitz-Thompson one. And then in that case, I would have NI, I would need to know the size of the domain, the true size of the domain NI, and I would multiply by the ratio between the total of y estimated using a Horvitz-Thompson estimator and the Horvitz-Thompson estimator of the size of the domain. The idea of the estimator here, I think you can see it a bit more, a bit more clearly, because if you had a sample that estimated the domain as being larger than what it was, you can expect it to be uh, to provide also an estimator of the total of y, which is larger than what it actually is, the true value of the parameter. And if you had a sample that gives you an estimate of the domain size, which is smaller than the actual size of the domain, then you would expect that the total estimator of the total of y would also be smaller. It corresponds to a smaller number of people. Okay. So the fact of using this this term here, ni, and this multiplied by this ni, generates an estimator that is much more efficient. It tends to have a smaller uh, variance. <clears throat> and however, if your sample sizes in the domains are small, then this estimator is not unbiased anymore. And that the bias of the hayek brewer estimator is generally very small. We don't really pay attention to that. It's, uh, it's almost unbiased. But if you're talking about using it for the estimation, of domains, then because the sample sizes are quite small, the bias can be something that is actually relevant. Estimating this is a ratio. You, you have the ratio between two estimators, so that's a nonlinear function. And estimating nonlinear functions is generally not terrible if you have a large population and a large sample size, but if you have small sample sizes, then the bias starts showing up. So this estimator for small domains can have actually can actually have a bias. <coughs> Uh, now, again, for the case of the mean that was defined in this way, I could define the Horvitz-Thompson estimator of the mean just by dividing by the uh, known ni, or I could define the Hayek-Brewer estimation of the mean by using here in the denominator. I didn't manage to hide this thing. This is the estimate uh, of ni, what I have here in the denominator. Now, this is how they look like. I'm just going to go back to the example all that I did last time and try to uh, show you how that works in the case of domains. OK, so um, uh, I have defined the Horvitz-Thompson estimator in this way. I'm going to use it as um, n over n. This is going to be my expansion factor. I'll show you how they, you know, where did that come from. 
where they come from, and I'm going to sum over the whole sample of that extended, that domain specific variable yik. I'm going to use the standard definition of the variance that I presented at the beginning. So considering the differences between the estimate that I obtain in one particular sample and the true value of the parameter, assuming because the horvitz thompson estimator is unbiased. OK, in the case of a simple random sampling, I already said that this looks uh, like that. Formula, the standard formula. I'm going to play again with selecting a sample size of three units from a universe that had four units. Those four units have exactly the same values that they had before, and I have exactly the same sample size. OK, again, four units in the population. I'm going to select three, but now I'm interested on estimating uh, on using these for estimating a uh, domains. And I'm going to assume that uh, the observations belong to domains in the following way. I'm going to assume that observations one and two belong to one domain and three and four belong to another domain. I'm going to be interested on estimating, uh, on obtaining estimates for the first domain, for the one that contains one and two. So I selected the sample without taking the domains into consideration. So I have the same four samples that I had before. What is the NI is going to be the sample size in that domain. I selected a sample size of three overall, but the, uh, the actual sample size that I observe in the domain is random. So in this sample, I only observe two which uh, belong to that domain. So I, my, that specific sample size in the domain is one. Here, one belongs to the domain of interest, three and four don't. So they don't belong to that domain. So the sample size, again, is one. The effective sample size in that domain is one. In the other two samples, I observe one and two. So I observe all two units that belong to that domain. Now I can uh, sum over the sample of yik. So two, three, four, but yik is going to be yik if the observation belongs to the domain and zero otherwise. So yik is actually three, seven, zero, zero. So the sum of yik over the whole sample is just going to be seven. And it's going to be three, seven, zero, zero. So the sum of yik in this sample is three. For the other two, it's going to be three plus seven. So in those two cases, I obtain 10. And then I calculate the horvitz thompson estimator. So you see, I'm doing exactly the same thing that I'm doing that I have done before. The only thing that extended variable, the domain specific variable that takes the value i yk or the value zero. And then I apply the expansion factor to that quantity. So seven times 1.33, that gives me 9.33. Three times 1.33, that gives me four, 10, and so on. Okay, I'm just multiplying those by this expansion factor. What is the expected value of the Horvitz Thompson estimator in that case? It's going to be given again by the average of those four values. You can calculate the average of those four values, is again 10 which is the total for that domain. If units one and two belong to that domain, then the true value of the parameter is three plus seven is 10. And that is the value of that estimator. So the horvitz thompson estimator is not only unbiased for the total of the population, but it's also unbiased for the total of the domains. That's it to see because the horvitz thompson estimator of the domain is just the horvitz thompson estimate of the total population later is unbiased. And what about the variance? By the variance, you would use this expression to calculate it. 9.33 minus 10 at the power of 2, 4 minus 10 at the power of 2, and so on, and then average those four values, and you're going to see that the variance in this case is 14.66. <clears throat> now I'm going to go back to the, the previous example, and I'm going to also reduce the sample size. So what happens if instead of selecting a three out of four elements, I select only one element. OK, same. I have four elements in the population, same values, but I'm just going to select one element. My expansion factor is four. Which are the possible that I have? I didn't take the domains into consideration when I selected the sample. So I have either one, two, three or four. Those are my four possible uh, samples. What is the effective sample size in that domain in each one of those samples? So one belongs to the domain. Have one observation, 
two belongs to the domain, so I have one observation. In these two cases, if these were my, sam my samples that were selected, I wouldn't have seen anyone. I'm done. There is nothing else I can do. I wouldn't have an estimate in that case. What is the sum over the sample of that domain specific variable? Exactly as I did it before, it would be three in this case, seven in this case, and zero in uh, the case of samples three and four, because neither of those units belong to uh, the domain of interest. And then I'm going to use the expansion factor. So three times four is 12, seven times four is 28. And in the other two cases, zero going to be zero and zero times four is just going to be zero. OK, what is the expected value of that indicator? I'm going to have to sum 12, 28, 0 and 0 divided by 4. And then I'm going to obtain that 10 uh, is the expected value because that's the true value of, value of the parameter. Once again, I saw that the Corbett's Thompson estimator is unbiased. The variance in this case is much larger, you see, because here's this is 28 or 0, the extreme value. Now I have more values that are varying in a wider a range. And when I calculate 12 minus 10 at the power of 2 plus 28 minus 10 at the power of 2 plus 0 minus 10 at the power of 2, when I calculate that average, then I get 132. So picking up this information and this information, what do I have? When I had three observations, the CV was 0 0.38, which if you see is much larger than the previous exercise that I had. And that's just because I have a smaller sample size and because that sample size is random. For n equal to 1, I actually have a CV that goes above 100 percent. Is 115 percent is the CV in that case. It's much larger. So this, for example, wouldn't be considered an estimate that is accurate enough to be published at Danny, I believe. And this clearly, it wouldn't be published about anywhere. And going back to the relevance of a, what the fact that I select only one sample, a, in this case, it's even more evident. If I were to select three units in total from the population, then my most extreme estimators, my most extreme estimators are four and 13. Okay? Whereas if I were to select only one unit, I can say that there is no one there that the average of y, the total of y is zero, or I can say that the total of y is 28. Depending on that's how lucky I am, whether I was lucky and I got this sample 12, which is not so far from 10, or otherwise, you see, in three out of four samples, I'm unlucky. So that, again, goes to the fact that variance. Variance is problematic, but variance is particularly problematic when you're talking about domains because you only get one chance to get it right. You only get one sample. And if the variance is large, the chance of you getting an estimate that is extreme, for example, zero, is higher. <clears throat> now I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm going to stratify. OK, so um, I'm going to by using the domains just to compare what happens in that case. So I have the Horvitz-Thompson estimator in the case of a stratification would be the sum of the Horvitz-Thompson estimator of the strat. Of the strat. So I have two strata here. And the variance, I say, it would be to obtain the variance of the horvitz thompson estimator in each strata and then sum them up. I have now defined the population so that the strata coincide with the domains. So observations one and two belong to strata one and observations three and four belong to strata two. The values for the y's are exactly the same. And uh, this, the population sizes are two in each strata, and I'm going to select one unit in strata one and two units in strata two. How many I select in strata two is not going to really matter in this case because the domains are equal to the strata, so basically what it matters is what is the sample size that I allocate in the first strata. Now, what are my possible samples under this scheme? So my possible samples is because I'm selecting two units in strata two and strata two only has two units, then three and four will always be in the sample. So actually, I only have two possible samples. I either selected three and four and one out of the other two, it was one or it was two. I'm selecting one between one and two and the two of the second strata, so three, four. So instead of having four samples like I had here or like I had here, now I only have two possible samples, one, three, four, and two, three, four. 
In both cases, the sample size allocated to that domain is one. It's not random anymore because I, I had decided that I wanted one in that particular strat. I could do that because those are strat. So that sample size is not random anymore. What is the sum of yik in that first strata? This is a very good situation because now in the case of 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 3, 4 is just going to have 3. In 2, 3, 4 is just going to be the value of 2, which is 7. And in the second strata, I always have 0. So you see, this is, this is actually fantastic because if I were to say that the variance of the horvitz thompson estimator is the sum over the strata of the variance within each strata, I have no contribution of variance for this strata. That's zero. That's great. That's fantastic news. And finally, the um, estimator horvitz thompson is the sum of the two horvitz thompson estimators. So these are going to be zero multiplied by the expansion factor. The expansion factor here is one, doesn't matter. And here, the expansion factor is uh, two. So this is going to be t times 2 is 6, 7 times 2 is 14. If I calculate the expected value of the horvitz thompson estimator and this, this stratified simple random sample uh, design, it's going to be the average over the samples. I only have two samples, 6 and 14, uh, and that's going to be uh, 10. It's still unbiased. If I calculate the variance using this formula here, then I, I'm going to obtain 16. Now I want to make a comparison with the previous uh, cases where that domain was unplanned and the sample size was random. So um, if I fix one, like in this case, in the stratification, I end up with a CV that is 0 0.4. In the previous two cases, those CVs were 0 0.38 and 1.15. The sample size was random and the expected domain sample size, how do I calculate the expected domain sample size? But I have two samples in which is one and two samples within uh, with, where is two. So it's 1.5. And in this case, I have two cases where is one and two cases where is zero. So it's going to be on average 1.5. So the expected sample sizes, uh, sorry, it's going to be 0 0.5. So the expected sample sizes are going to be 0 0.5 and 1.5. So imagine that I'm comparing those three figures. I have an expected sample size of 0 0.5 gives me gives me a CV of 115%. And expect a fixed sample size of one gives me a CV, a CV of 0 0.4. That's fantastic compared to the 115. And I just had to add half a unit, basically. And if I add an, an entire, a, another half a unit, I just managed to reduce it to 0 0.38. So I have two things varying here. One thing is increase or decrease in the sample size. And the other thing is whether it's fixed or whether the sample size is random. Now you can see that it, there is an impact of increasing sample size because if the sample size is random, I can go between 115 to 0.38 in terms of uh, CV. But actually what matters the most is the fact that I can fix the sample size because I have half the sample size in this case than the, than the sample size that I have here. I have, sorry, I have one unit and I have 1.5 here, and I have basically the same CV. So fixing, being able to plan in advance is really, really good. The problem is that in general, we cannot really plan for all the domains of interest. If we could, the world would be fantastic and we would just do this. We wouldn't have to do any other, uh, use any other uh, methods. Again, ignoring the CVs and thinking in terms of the, of the most extreme estimates, um, the, the ones have the smallest CVs are going to have the less extreme estimates. So in the largest case, I, I have estimates between 0, 0 and 28, whereas in the other cases, I have 6 and 14 or uh, wait a second, 6 and, uh, 6 and 14 or 4 and 13. So I'm, 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 I'm leaving less to luck if you want. I'm, I'm taking a smaller risk in those other two cases. <coughs> uh, finally here, I just want to close this example by using a different estimator. So what happened if instead of using the horvitz thompson estimator, I use the Hagic a uh, brewer estimator. So now my estimator is defined by this expression. I estimate the total of Y, I estimate the population size, and then I multiply by the true population size. I am in the same situation, and I'm going to consider that I have three 
units selected and the domain is unplugged. Okay, so I have the same four samples that I had before. I have the four Horvitz Thompson estimators that I calculated here. I'm just going to bring them there. I could calculate the estimator of the sample size of the population size using the same thing. This is just the Horvitz Thompson estimator of a binary variable that takes the value one if that unit belongs to the domain and zero otherwise. And then I can obtain n times I can calculate this quantity. These are my estimated using the Hadzik Brewer estimator instead of the Horvitz Thompson one. Now, for this exercise, this estimator is also unbiased, but this is not a generality. The Hadzik Brewer estimator can be biased, especially if the sample sizes are small. The variance in terms of variance, the variance for this case is eight. In contrast, the variance of the Horvitz Thompson estimator for the exactly the same sampling design and exactly the same sample size was 14.66. So how come I have, you see, I selected the same design, it's the same sampling design, both are simple random sample. I selected the same sample, um, the same set of samples. I'm just changing the estimator. I have the same sample size and I'm going from a variance of 14.66 to a variance of eight. Why is that happening? Because this estimator is much more efficient because it's able, you can see it here, I think, when you have a large estimator of the, of the total of Y, you also have a large estimator of the population size. And when you have a small estimator of the total of Y, you also have a small estimator of the population size. So when you calculate the ratio, those ratios are more stable than the initial estimators. So that estimator, the Hadzik Brewer, ends up being more efficient. That's why that estimator is more efficient, because this ratio has less variability than the initial totals. Um, OK, questions up to that bit? Oh, no, for the moment. No, for the moment. Judy, you wanted to say something? The microphone on? No? OK. Yes, yeah, so basic uh, the, the, the take home messages for, from these three examples. <clears throat> Number one, if you have a larger sample size, you have a smaller variance. If you have a smaller variance, that means that you're leaving less to chance, because in practice, you're gonna only going to see one sample. If you're unlucky, that's bad. But if the variance is small, then you have less problem of being unlucky. That's, uh, that's um, take home message number one. Take home message number two. If you can fix the sample size using stratification instead of leaving it random, then that makes a massive difference in terms of the variance of the estimator. And three, if you can use an estimator like the Hadzik Brewer estimator, then you may be in a better scenario if the sample size is not too small. This can have a problem of bias. But in terms of variance, there are estimators that are more efficient than the Horvitz Thompson estimate. For example, this one is more efficient. Okay, so those are. Uh, those are the take home message from uh, those examples. Now, this last bit that I show you, show you uh, that um, the Hadzik Brewer estimator is more efficient than the Horvitz Thompson. The Hadzik Brewer is a type of estimator that is called a ratio estimator because it's built as the ratio of two estimators. It's the ratio between a Horvitz Thompson here and a Horvitz Thompson there. You see, I'm estimating a total, but I'm using a ratio estimator for doing that. The, the Hadzik Brewer estimator uses the true domain sizes as auxiliary information, but you can imagine that you could use any other kind of variable. It doesn't have to be the population size. So if you had, let's say, a variable X that was a positively correlated with Y, then you could put it exactly where you put here, the population size, and obtain a more efficient estimator. Those estimators are the ratio estimators. So for example, if uh, I'm interested in estimating turnover for this year. That's my why. But I have turnover for the past year. OK, so if I were to know for sure what was the turnover of uh, all companies in that particular domain for the last year, then I would know that, var that this value TXI, the sum over the domain of XI. In that case, if I have also the XI 
in the sample uh, for the observations in the sample, then I could use this ratio estimator, which is called the ratio estimator one. OK, so you see I'm using this TXI. Like I have used the NI in the case of the Hadjik Brewer estimator and just using X being another variable for which I have auxiliary information and uh, that is positively correlated uh, with Y. Here I'm assuming that I know the totals of that variable for each one of the domains of interest because this quantity has to be known. That defines the so-called ratio estimator one. Now, if I don't know the totals for the domains, but for example, I know the total for the whole population, then I could also try to use that as auxiliary information. So that gives me the second ratio estimator. You see the numerator is the same, is the Tohorvitz Thompson estimator of the total of the variable that I'm interested in. And this is going to be TX is the total, the national total, whereas here I have the total in that domain. And this is the Horvitz Thompson estimator of that national total, whereas here is the Horvitz Thompson estimator of the total in that domain. OK, those are two different types of, uh, of estimators. Now, which one do you think is more efficient without looking at the last at the last sentence? So clearly this one has much more information than this. Here I only know what was the total at the national level. Here I know it for each one of the domains. So um, the fact of using data at the domain level typically makes this first estimator, ratio estimator, more efficient, has smaller variance than the second one. But even if you don't have that information, it's possible that the second one is still more efficient than a Hurwitz-Thompson estimator, for example. OK, and those two are asymptotically unbiased estimators. Asymptotically, then that means uh, that in the case of domains, you need to assume that domain sample sizes are going to infinity. Otherwise, these estimators can have a considerable bias. This is what I was mentioning about the Hadjik uh, Brewer estimator. <clears throat> OK. Um, because it's coming in. OK, so um, so we were talking about those ratio estimators. We have the ratio estimator one and we have the ratio estimator two. Now, those two estimators can be written in a different way. So here I write them as this is the total that I know, and this is a ratio between a Horvitz, two pairs of Horvitz Thompson estimators, between a pair of Horvitz Thompson estimators. I could write those estimators as a weighted sum of the observations uh, in the sample. So if you look at it, okay, look at this one. Um, this, each one of those Horvitz Thompson estimator is the sum of something uh, over the sample, right? So I could write that as uh, I could write that as the sum. I could write that in this way. Look at it here. If I define GK as this ratio, TX over TX Horvitz Thompson, and I define IK like one over the inclusion probability, this is the expansion factor, then I can write that a ratio to estimator, for example, as a weighted sum of the observations in the sample. Now, this is extremely convenient, even more convenient, because if I can calculate these weights and put them as an auxiliary, as an extra variable in my data set, then whenever I need to get estimates for something, I just need to take the variable, multiply by that weight, and sum. That would give me the estimator. I don't need to calculate one for Bits Thompson calculate another Horvitz Thompson, multiply, divide. I just need to multiply by that weight and sum. So it's very convenient in terms of estimation. The product of those two uh, terms, of those two uh, factors, it's called WK. That's going to be the weight, a final weight. OK? Tell me. Tell me, Judy. No, I think it's because you have your microphone open. I'm going to, I don't think I can close your microphone. Can I? Oh, yeah. OK. <coughs> OK. And uh, so I can write those estimators as weighted, as weighted sums. And that defines, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to open uh, additional possibilities for us. 
So uh, I presented two different ratios estimators for the case of uh, the ratio one, which uses domain specific information then that term GK is going to be the same for all elements in domain in a given domain, but it's going to change from one domain to another. Whereas for the second ratio estimator, which only uses information at the total national total level, then you just have one weight adjustment that a factor that applies for the entire uh, sample. These new weights, these new WK weights that I'm defining here, Define a weighting system that can be used for any variable Y of interest. So whenever you have to process the data for the whole survey, it's really, really useful if you can define those weights and just multiply whichever variable you're interested in by that weight and sum. It's extremely convenient for data processing uh, purposes. The resulting estimator using those weights would be more efficient than just a simply simple Horvitz-Thompson estimator whenever there is a positive linear relationship between the variable X that is being used to define the weights and the variable of interest Y. Now, normally we work with, in, with surveys that are multi-purpose. So you may have many different variables of interest and you want to have one weighting system that applies for all the variables. You've seen, for example, with the HEIH, you apply the same weight regardless of which variable is Y. So in that sense, this is something that you do and you choose variables that are correlated with the main indicators that you're interested in. So, for example, things like unemployment, uh, the leading indicators of a particular survey that may be optimal for some variables and less good for other ones. But you expect that on average, it would still be better than not using auxiliary information uh, at all. Now, those estimators, uh, the, uh, in particular, the ratio two estimator, the ones that use information at the national level, has weights that are, are called calibrated, and they're calibrated in a particular sense. They're called calibrated because if you were to obtain the estimate of that variable that is used to define the weights. So I was talking that my, uh, my variable of interest is, let's say, a turnover this year. My auxiliary variable is, let's say, turnover the last year. So if I were to use my sample to estimate turnover last year, if I were to use that, that, uh, that those weights to estimate um, the total of turnover last year, I would obtain the true turnover. So those weights are called calibrated in the sense that for whichever variable is used to define the weight, your estimator, the value of your estimator coincides exactly with the true value of the parameter for every single sample. So, so far we have said that some estimators were unbiased and that meant that in different samples, they would take different values, but on average, they would coincide with the true value of the parameter. When the weights are calibrated for the variables that are calibrated, then the value of the estimator is exactly the true value of the parameter that you have set here, Tx, for every single sample. It's reproduced automatically in every single sample. Okay, when you use uh, the um, uh, ratio estimator one, you don't have it at the national level, but you have it at each one of the uh, domains. This property of calibration is something that is the, of high interest for National Statistical Office offices um, and is shared by a much larger class of estimators that we're going to talk a bit about now that are called calibration estimators. So why is this a property that national statistical offices are interested in? Uh, because you can uh, make sure that the estimates that you obtain for some variables in your survey correspond, for example, with estimates that are obtained by other surveys. So that gives you consistency. Let me talk a little bit about that. So imagine, for example, that you have population projections. OK, and Danny is saying via population projections that in the whole country, there are 25 million women and 20 million men. OK, that's what the population projections say. Now you have the HEIH. From the HEIH, you could be able to get an estimate of the distribution by age as well. And now if you calculate that distribution from the HEIH, it tells you that instead of 25 million women, you have 23 million women. OK, some users have no problem with that, but some users do. So it's convenient for you if you can make sure 
that things like that, distribution by age and sex, for example, coincide exactly with other figures that come from other sources. So that we can do by using these type of estimators. So for example, if you were to use as auxiliary variable, the total of women at the national level, then you would make sure that whenever people take the HIH and estimate the total of women at national level, they would get exactly the same value as the population projections. Okay. I believe the HIH weights, the HIH weights are calibrated, but I'm not sure about that. I don't know if any of you uh, has that piece of information. I, I don't know. Okay, no problem. I'm going to leave it as a homework. Maybe somebody can find out between now and Friday whether those weights are calibrated or not. Tell me, Jose. Uh, I think they are because uh, the, the, the results, uh, the notes of the result, was, uh, they usually say something like uh, HH projections, the HH uh, census. To 20 census, 2005 projections of census, um, to a to 2018 projections, and okay. um, I I have sorry I have a question. Uh, I I don't know if I I, I don't I'm I'm not sure, but I I want to verify this if I am interpreting this well um. You said that there are, maybe there are some variables in the survey that using the the factor the expansion factor the expansion factors are not uh, that uh, well estimated as as other variables uh, because they are not the, the expansion factors are optimally building built or optimally estimated for some of the key variables, but not for the like the secondary or, or not that in not that main variables in the survey. Is that is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. So basically, the issue is that you have to make a choice. You may to make, you have to make a balance between what is feasible and what is pragmatic and what is optimal. So the initial sampling weights, even when you plan the sampling design. You, you, you see, I mentioned um, I mentioned sample size allocation, for example. You remember? Here we talk about sample size allocation. So this first sample size allocation, proportional allocation, that doesn't depend on Y. It only depends on the on the population sizes of the strata. But this second one, Neyman allocation, depends on SH, the variance of Y in the strata H. But if you have many Ys, then you have many variances. So even from the sampling design, when you plan the sampling design, you have to identify in advance some leading indicators, some leading variables, and you design for those, and then you pray, <laughs> basically. You pray that oh. what works for those that are the principal variables is not gonna be terribly bad, and generally is not, for many other things that you're measuring. But optimality, you're trying to build optimality for the key indicators of your, of your survey, even though that may not necessarily mean that you're doing something that is optimal for everything else. So that's one of the of the compromises that the design based approach uh, does. I mean, I think it's, it's really, really nice that you that you pointed that out because everything with the design based approach is about making things pragmatic, making little assumptions if you have. Now, you could do better if you were happy to assume, for example, a distribution assumption for Y. But then that you have to do that for every single Y. It's a lot of work. OK, so we do we say we compromise. We say we're not going to do that. We're going to do something that is maybe not optimal for anything or maybe optimal for this small set of variables and hopefully not so bad for the others. You compromise on optimality on the basis of getting more of, of being more um, of easiness, for example, of things like processing. OK, or to avoid making specific assumptions. Now, these were the, the this, these sample sizes gave me the original the design weights. So the design weights, the design is planned already, maybe is better for some variables than for other variables. And that's just something we have to deal with. And then after that, if I use an estimator that modifies the weights, like these type of estimators, 
that uses a new set of weights that are, for example, calibrated to satisfy certain constraints, then that system may work better for some variables than for other ones. So again, yeah, we try to do something that is the best for the main indicators, and we pray that things are not terribly bad for all the other indicators. Now, this use of calibrating the weights for things like age and sex, groups of age and sex to the population projections, for example, you can see that may have an effect in efficiency. It may probably lead to an estimator that is more efficient, that has smaller variance than an estimator that doesn't use that information. But originally, it's not even done because of uh, efficiency. It's done because of consistency in presentation because you don't want to have to go out and explain to users that, yes, when they sum the, by age and sex in the HEIH, they get some totals that are not exactly the totals from the population projections. And what is the implication of that? What, are they, what, are they, what is the impact of that in all the other analysis that they have to do? You know, So you rather close that discussion and make sure that your weights are consistent with what other things uh, do. I guess, for example, if you have other surveys like Calidad de Vida or things like that, then they may be even calibrated to results that come from census as well, population projections, maybe even things uh, from HEIH. But in those cases, in the case of household surveys, this often is done just by consistency of presentation because you don't want to open the discussion about which, which is the true distribution, the one that gives me the population projections or the one that I obtained when I estimated from the HEIH. Is this helpful? Yes, it, perfect. But um, this is this is called a weighted sum estimator. This, this is like another layer that com that comes after the 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 this, the discussion of expansion factor. Yes, this is an adjustment uh, that it is made after after the uh, after the 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 expansion factor discussion we, we have seen. Yes. 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 Okay. We started with a basic set of expansion factors that were coming from the sampling design that were the ones that you would use if you would use a Horvitz Thompson estimator. Horvitz Thompson estimator does not require any additional information. So the expansion factors are just the one that the design told you. Now we're talking about all the set of estimators that use auxiliary information. And that auxiliary information is used in a way that can be expressed as a new, renew expansion factor. I'm going to talk a bit more about them in terms of expansion factors in a moment because I'm going to talk about calibration estimators. But if you want to know a bit more about these bits, about the calibration bits, I think there was some, uh, just to, to, to talk about myself because it's nice. <laughs> I did an, a really nice job uh, for, uh, for the census 2005. I think it was the first time that we did a very large a scale application of calibration in the in Dani. So I don't know how much, how familiar are, with you, are you with that? I'm just going to tell you the basics of the story in three minutes. Uh, census 2000, census 19, 1993, for example, was a normal census. You go to everybody and you ask exactly the same questions. Census 2005, the one previous from the 2011, was a census that had two questionnaires. It had a long form questionnaire that everybody in the population answer, and it had a short form questionnaire that was asked to a sample in every single municipality in the country. We selected a sample for every single municipality and uh, we collected information of that much longer questionnaire in a small in a small sample in each one of those of those municipalities. Then at the end, when we consolidated all the, all the data, we had, of course, common variables between the sample and the population. So things like age, sex, uh, things like disability, for example, level of education, those things were present both in the census and in the survey. So whenever we were, when, when we decided to release results from the census 2005 in Dani, uh, we needed that those variables as much as possible would have this consistency in presentation. So if you asked for educational level, in the census and in the sample, you didn't want to have people finding two different estimates depending on which one of those two sources they were using because the, th the whole thing was part of the same field work, you know? You didn't want to have those disparities. So for, two th for the 2005 census, we formulated what I believe it, it has been the largest, the first, the first uh, largest uh, and largest uh, scale 
use of calibration, where we calibrated the sample of each one of those municipalities to satisfy exactly the totals that were obtained by that census at those levels of municipality. I'm going to talk a bit more about calibration now, and then I'm going to tell you which what worked and what didn't work in that application. But if you have time in the next few days or whatever to, to just uh, give a look and find out in Danny what happened with the calibration of census 2005, uh, I think that that would be helpful for you to understand what, all what's coming. Okay. <coughs> that's that's Thank you. very old. Tell me, Jose. It is very interesting indeed. Um, so th there was a, 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 a longer, a larger questionnaire and, and a shorter one. Yes, yeah. that, that, that is the case. Okay. I, I, I have, I haven't, I do not have idea of that of, of the of these exercises but That's because you guys so. are too young <laughs> maybe because of that yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah you guys are too young but uh but yeah some people was happy some people was not very happy and at the end for example for 2018 i think you guys went with just one questionnaire and that was it but for 2005 we have those two because the idea was that people wanted to ask much many many more things that you could have asked that was feasible in terms of the budget of the census. So this is why we went with like the basic questionnaire that it was still long, and then a much, much longer questionnaire in a, in a massive sample. I don't remember exactly at the moment, but I think that sample was something like 2.5 million households. It was massive because it was going parallel with the census, so, so it could be that big. So I, I don't remember exactly, but I think it was something like 2.5 million people. I worked on that operative, so that was that was really nice. That was one of the last things that I did that. OK, so I'm going to stop there because I, <laughs> this is not about that. Uh, and then I'm going to talk more about weighted sum estimators. OK, so I define those ratio estimators initially just seeing them as I have the Hajek Brewer estimator. Why do I have to use the population size? Why I cannot use just another variable that is related to Y in a linear way? So I define the ratio estimators and then I just see that those ratio estimators can be written as a weighted in the form of a weighted estimator. So there are many other weight uh, um, estimators that can be defined in that way. So imagine now that instead of having one variable, I have a set of variables. I have X1 all the way to XP auxiliary variables, which are known, okay? If I know the totals of those auxiliary variables, let's say, I don't know, at the population level, for example, and those variables have been collected in the sample, then I can uh, develop a new system of weights that minimizes the distance respect to the initial design weights, one over pi k, that I called ak, while satisfying calibration constraints. So the idea behind calibration estimators is you don't want to move too far away from the design weights because the design weights are not bad. You know that the horvitz thompson estimator is unbiased. So that's not that's not bad. You want to you want to stay relatively close, but at the same time, if you can be relatively close to the design weights and at the same time reproduce those totals perfectly, then that's the best scenario. That's a new question, Jose. Or you forgot to. Do you have another question, Jose? Another question, Jose? Sorry, I forgot. Okay, no problem. Okay, okay. So that's the idea behind calibration. I'm going to generate a new system of weights that has two characteristics. One is as close as possible to uh, the original sampling design weights, and two, that satisfy those calibration constraints in the sense that whenever I use those weights to estimate the totals of the variables xk that are involved in the in the of the weights, total that I have fixed um, for every sample, okay? <clears throat> That's the idea behind calibration estimators. We don't, because those are not bad, they are uh, unbiased, so we, we still want to be close to those, but we want to satisfy, be able to satisfy those calibrations, uh, calibration constraints, either because that leads to more efficiency or because of presentation purposes, because I, I want to get the exact estimates by age and sex in the population, for example. Now, some uh, good properties of this kind of system of weights uh, are present here. So I'm presenting them here. So basically, if you have the 
calibrated weights, those calibrated weights are additive. Are additive in the sense that if you get, you were to calibrate each one of the domains or calibrate, then the two things are equivalent. If you calibrated the domains and get an estimate, use those calibrated weights to get an estimate of the total, you would get the same estimate of the total that you would have obtained if you would calibrate it ignoring those domains. So those the, the weights are additive in that sense. The estimates are the same. Now, I say that you want a set of weights that is close to the design weights. And how do I define close? I have to talk about the distance measure. There are different calibration estimators de uh, defined in terms of different distance measures, but a commonly, very commonly used distance measure is called the chi-square distance measure that is defined by the expression that I have here. So I'm going to take AK are the design weights, 1 over pi K. WK are my new weights, the ones that I'm looking for. And this is the distance between those two, or the difference between them, them, them two, I then elevate to the power of two. And I divide by AK, the design weight, times QK. Now, who's QK? QK is usually is, is a set of known constants. I have to decide who the QKs are going to be, but they often represent the variance of YK given XK and their sum assumed mod. OK, so if I'm saying that X are, is related to Y uh, by a linear model with the heteroselastic variance, for example, where the variance of Y is proportional to XK or proportional to the inverse of XK, then that helps me to define these constants QK. In other cases, I just leave them being a uh, one. If this is the distance that I'm minimizing, then there is a, the solution of that problem of finding the weights that are the closest in this sense to the AKs and that satisfy the calibration constraints are given by this expression. So I have here the design weight times one plus this is that constant QK that I'm saying is one number, one number for each one of the observations. This is XK prima, uh, that is the vector of observations for observation K the vectors of auxiliary variables for observation k, for unit k, and lambda is, uh, this, this problem is solved via Lagrangian multiplier. So lambda is the, the resulting Lagrangian multiplier. The Lagrangian multiplier is given by this expression here. So I'm defined first Ts, which is just the sum of ak, the design weights, times qk, that constant, xk, xk prima, those two this is just the, uh, as I said, it is the vector of auxiliary variables for that particular unit k. And then defining this as Ts, then lambda is Ts at the power of minus one times this term, which is the difference between the totals, the true totals that I'm fixing, and the estimates of those exact same totals that I would obtain from the sample using a Horvitz-Thompson estimator. So this is how you calculate them. Now, this equation doesn't tell me more but there are different ways, ways of writing that estimator. So when I take, I say my estimator had this form, it was gonna be like WK times YK. So if I write it like that, WK times YK, but I substitute here all those things to say, who is WK, it's just algebra, then you, re, you arrive to this expression. You arrive to an expression that has is the sum of the Horvitz-Thompson estimator of y plus a correction term. And that correction term is the difference between the true totals, the estimates of those totals that you can make from your sample using the Horvitz-Thompson estimator, and this is a regression coefficient, an estimator of the population regression coefficient if you were to have census y and the x's. So imagine that you have a census data, you have no sample, you have census data, you have y u response variable, the set of x's. If you were to fit a population level, that census level regression between the y and the x's, then that would be controlled by a vector of coefficients that is denoted beta. This is the estimator that I can make of that beta using the sample uh, that I have. OK? So now that estimator that here it looks like, like, I don't know, <laughs> I don't have much of an interpretation for this expression. Now it has a really nice in, in, in interpretation. You see, and depending on how, it, we, at which level do I have information, then this term 
is just one term for the whole population or is one term by domain. It depends on which variables do I put in this in this uh, context. Now, this estimator is called the generalized regression estimator. OK, and uh, it can be it wasn't here, but it can be motivated under an assumed model for y. So here we just motivated it from the part from the, the distance and the calibration constraints, but it can be you arrive to the same expression by assuming a particular model for y. What something is something that is important here is that the characteristics, the advantages of this estimator, in particular, it's asymptotic consistency. The fact that the bias goes to zero and the variance goes to zero when the sample sizes uh, increase is not dependent on whether that model is true or not. So that, I, and at the beginning, I said something like this is design based model assisted in the sense that you can motivate those estimators, particularly Greg, you can motivate them by assuming a particular linear regression model, but the properties don't depend on that model being true. Whereas when you pass to the model based estimation, you need to make sure that that model fits well the data. In this case, if the model is not correct, then you just don't gain much. But uh, but you don't, the, the properties do not depend on the model uh, being correct. Now, to estimate the variance of this estimator, we also have an expression that is very straightforward. It is like estimating the, the variance of a Horvitz Thompson estimator, but on the errors of the term. The variance here is given by the errors. An estimator of the variance is given by the residuals of that regression model. OK, now let me try to give you a few examples so that uh, things are a bit more clear. So what happens if I have only one variable, one auxiliary variable? XK is a positive auxiliary variable, and I assume that those QK constants are given by one divided by XQ. How does that estimator look like in this case? So I say that TS was the sum of this multiplication of all these terms. OK, now XK. Uh, is one is just one variable. QK is one over XK. So QK, XK, that's one vanishes. So that's going to be just the sum over S of alpha AK, XK. Now AK is the expansion factor. So if I take XK, multiply by the expansion factor and sum over the sample, what I get is the Horvitz Thompson estimator of X. Who's lambda in that case? But it's going to be this quantity at the power of minus one. But that's just a number, it's not a matrix. I can just pass it here to divide. It's just a number, it's one number. Multiplied by the difference between the Tx, we have only one variable, so this is just one number, Tx, minus the Horvitz Thompson estimator of that same Tx. Okay, now you can see it here. I can just take this divided by this minus one. So this is the form of lambda. And now W, the final weights. I say they were the designed expansion factors times one plus QK XK prima lambda. Now, if this is lambda, QK times XK again is going to be one because QK is one over XK and XK is XK, so that's going to be one. So it's just going to be one plus lambda. Okay? And then because lambda is this, then it's going to be one plus this minus one is just this quantity. So it's going to be AK times this quantity. Now let me build the estimator. I say the estimator was the sum of the WKs times YIK. If the WK is this, then I can see that this term, I can take it out of the sum, and I just have the sum of IK times YIK. AK, YIK is the Horvitz Thompson estimator of, of Y, the total of Y. So this, this particular choice, of x k being a positive variable and q k being one over x k leads me to the second ratio estimator. So I'm just saying I did all this turn of everything things just to tell you the second ratio estimator is a calibration estimator. It's a particular choice of a calibration estimator. Um, <clears throat> but in that case, the second ratio estimator you remember used only information at the national level. I had other estimators that used information at the domain level. So I can also define that another Greg using in that case calibration 
calibrating to a new variable that is going to be given by xk times that indicator of the domain. And uh, if I calibrate using that as auxiliary information and this choice for qk, then I arrive to the first ratio estimator. <clears throat> okay, so you see I'm, I'm building, I have built two calibration estimators using different kind of information. In one case, I only had, let's say, age, the total population of by, by gender, for example. I only have the total of females in the population at the national level. That was the information that I needed in this case. In this case, I need the total number of women per domain. And then I calibrate so that I get the total population of women per domain, those totals, each one of them satisfied. They reproduce those totals in each one of the domains. That leads me to the first ratio estimator. I could do things in between. I could, for example, uh, use um, a different partition, not necessarily the one of the domains of interest. And then in that case, I would have an estimator that goes kind of in between the ratio one and the ratio two, and it would have a variance that is somewhere in between ratio one and ratio two. It's basically up to how, which, which kind of information do I have? Do I have information at the domain? Do I have information? Maybe my domains are municipalities and I don't have information at the municipality level, but I do have at the department level. Maybe I can use that. Or if I don't have, then I have the national level. I can use that as well. <clears throat> it's about which kind of information do you have? Um, there is other type of, uh, of uh, calibration weight. If I use this, uh, as auxiliary information, I end up with a Greg that actually has, you see this one uh, has a betas that are domain specific. It leads me to a regression model that has domain specific betas. I think I'm gonna close here soon. I'm gonna talk quickly. I'm gonna compare, give you, give you a, a, an idea of comparison of different estimators. Uh, um, um, using this example from a paper from Latin and Invasion uh, in 2009. <clears throat> okay, so let me just uh, show you here. Um, in this example, uh, this uh, they are using real data. They have uh, 12 domains. It's a relatively small example. They have 12 regions in Finland. Those are their domains, and they have a total population size that only is uh, 431,000 households. That's the population size. They're interested in measuring uh, the total, I believe, of the household disposable income, and they're using two different auxiliary variables. They have the people with higher education um, in the household, the number of people that has higher education in a particular household, and they have the number, the total number of months that people in that household was in employment the last year. So you can imagine that those two variables should be positively correlated with disposable income. If people spend spend more times more time in uh, in employment, then they should have, a, have had a higher income. And if they have higher education, then you could also expect that they would have a higher disposable income. So you have two variables that are positively correlated with Y IDN. They have selected a sample size of a thousand uh, observations using a stratified PIPS the proportional to size sampling design, where uh, the domains are actually uh, strata. In this case, we're in the best case scenario where they could have fixed, they fixed the sample size in each one of the domains because the domains were considered a strata, okay? They use some form of allocation. So I'm comparing, they're comparing four estimators. First, they have the horvitz thompson estimator that uses no auxiliary information just the expansion factors that come from the sampling design. Then they use the Hajek brewer estimator, which is using as auxiliary information the sample sizes of the domains. And then they have two different calibration estimators. They have one that uses the domain sizes and the domain totals of one of the two variables, the number of months that people was employed last year, another one that uses the three variables, the domain sizes and the totals by domains of both a, the number of employed months that have been employed and the people with higher education. So which kind of statistics they're using to compare those estimators? They have uh, um, uh, um, um, uh, median and average. 
this is, uh, if, I, if this one moves, they have a, um, uh, um, uh, an average CV that is just uh, the average over the, over the 12 domains of the corresponding CVs. And they also are considering a absolute relative errors, the average of those absolute relative errors, which compare the total estimated in that particular domain minus the true total divided by the uh, true total. And then this is an absolute value and they calculate the average over all the domains. So what can we see here? Let me look, for example, at, at the CV uh, figures. They have domains, 12 domains classified as in three different sizes. You can have minor domains, medium domains or major domains. As minor domains, they call something that has a sample size between eight units and 33 units. Medium domains have sample size between 34 and 45 units and major domains have a sample size between 46 and 277 uh, observations. Now, to me, even those minor domains are relatively big, to, to be completely honest, but okay, let's, let's just use this classification. Now, let's see how the information, having auxiliary information may change things for each one of those domains. So let's start by the smaller domains. So if I look at the CVs uh, on average across small, the, min the minor domains, then when I use no information, no auxiliary information, the average CV is 11.9. When they use only the sample, the population sizes, as in the Hajek Brewer estimator, that CV goes to 10.9. They involve now the number of months that people has been employed and that CV goes to 7.7. .7. And then if you include on top of that the level of education, then you go down to 6.8. So for minor domains, it seems that there is quite a considerable change. I mean, the final CV involving all the auxiliary information that is available is a roughly half the CV that you had when you used absolutely no auxiliary information. Now for medium domains, you can see that the gains are much less, uh, much smaller. And for major domains, there is some gain, but again, the gains are, are much smaller. So this is telling me the, auxiliary, the use of auxiliary information is actually more important for uh, the cases where you have very, very tiny domains than when you have large domains. Now, again, here the domains are strata. So you are in a situation where you at least you have sample in every domain. At least you, you don't have out of sample uh, domains. You have a, a bit of observations in each one of those uh, domains, okay? Now, the second part of the example, everything remains the same, but it's just that uh, the domains now are unplanned. So my domains are not strata. In that case, if I consider the same, the same, uh, the same type of domains uh, and compare, the, let's say, the Horvitz-Thompson estimator versus two different types of Greg estimator, one using population size and the total number of months employed versus domain size and total number of, uh, in, in, these are the population level variables and these are the domain level variables. Then if I consider again those CVs, you can see the Horvitz-Thompson estimator for minor domains had a, an average CV of 28.3. Uh, without any auxiliary information involving those two variables, the population size and the total number of months, basically doesn't change any of the CVs for any of the types of domains, actually. Whereas involving all the number of uh, the domain totals for the population ones, there is no change. But when I involve domain specific information, when I use domain specific auxiliary variables, then there is a massive change in all of the types of uh, domain, okay? The, the, it can be three times, it's one third of the, of the size of this uh, CV, or this is almost half the size of that CV. Again, you see much more gain for smaller domains than you see for large domains, but this is the extra advantage of being using um, auxiliary information that is domain specific rather than information that is at the total level of the population. In this case, you gain nothing by using information at the total level of the population, but that is not generally the case. It's not necessarily the case. You may gain something. You're not never going to gain as much 
as if you have information at the domain level, but you may gain something. It's just in this case, there is, uh, there is no, no particular gain. Um, the gains between using population and uh, a population level data or domain level data are going to be depending on uh, the expected domain sizes and how different the in domain regression vectors would be from an overall uh, regression vector. So if let's say in that model that we're assuming, if the beta of the different domains, if they're relatively similar, then it may be that assuming an overall beta like we do here, when you just have information at the total population level is not that bad. But if there is lots of differences between the domains, then is much better. It's going to be much better to use domain specific uh, information. We're going to illustrate this further uh, with the lab. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm going to close here with this slide, and then I think we continue on Friday. We finish on Friday. We're almost done. Um, calibration. A, a few last comments about calibration and grade. Calibration is a very general tool. I show you that whenever you assume this particular distance, the chi-square distance, then you end up with an estimator, a generalized regression estimator, but calibration is much more general than that. You can use um, different distance, you can use instrumental variables, and more importantly, you can use auxiliary information at many different levels. You can use the information that goes at the total population level, at the domain level of interest if you have it, at strata, at other domains that may not be these particular domains of interest, but that are going to be helpful as well, acting as post strata uh, as well. When um, So in that sense, using auxiliary information as much as you can in the calibration, it seems to be a good thing. It's going gonna, it's gonna to lead you to a more efficiency. However, if you use very complex calibration constraints, there is, there is a risk of weight instability. So let's say if you want to control by everything, then at the end you may end up with situations where the weights, you end up with very extreme weights for some observations, which is not ideal. So if you if you try to thread too, too fine, if you try to go too low to use too many constraints, then it's possible that your weights start becoming a bit erratic and then you're just defeating the, the purpose because the estimator is going to be unstable just because the weights are, are unstable. There are ways to impose bounds on those weights. So let's say you only let allow weights that are as top three times the original design weights, nothing more than that. But in that case, the algorithms become a bit more complicated. There is no uh, guarantee of uh, convergence on the estimation of the weight. So all those things are a bit complicated. The idea is that you can use variables, but don't try to thread too, too fine. Bottom line, if using domain specific data, uh, there is no solution in terms of domain estimation, which is the, the objective of this course. Uh, there is a still, these methods still offer no solution for the case of zero observations. If you have no observations in one domain, you still, there is nothing of the things that I have discussed to you, with you today that can be helpful. Um, and there is also not going to be big gains if you have very small, very, very small sample uh, sam domain sample sizes under uh, this approach. Uh, now, um, I introduced those estimators thinking on calibration as a weighting system, talking about the chi-square distance and so on. But you can also motivate, particularly Greg, using uh, regression models, which is what I'm going to do in the last part of uh, this lecture that I'm going I'm, to we're going to do on, on Friday. OK, so I just wanted to give you a last comment about the, the exercise that we do. We did for census 2005, for example. Because uh, that was uh, a situation that it was like a textbook example of what happens in, in bullet point two. We had so many variables that we wanted to calibrate by that sometimes the weights just didn't converge. We didn't manage to find uh, weights, calibrated weights for some domains. So if you see the documentation from that calibration exercise for the census sample of census 2005, you're going to see that I had to write things like in these domains for these departments or for these municipalities, the set of calibration constraints are these, and for this other set of departments are these, and for this other set of departments are those, because sometimes we just had to drop constraints because we wouldn't be able to find weights that satisfy the massive set of constraints that we have. So you have to be a bit careful on that. Otherwise, again, you either find no solutions or you end up with solutions that are extremely unstable. Okay. 
So that's all what I wanted to tell you here. I don't know if anybody has any comments, questions, otherwise well, we will see you again on Friday, just to close. Uh, I need to talk about indirect and direct estimators, synthetic estimators, composite estimators, and a little bit about um, variance estimation.